Welcome to Our Redeemer Lutheran's Church Matins Worship Service for the fourth Sunday of Easter. This Sunday is also called Jubilate, and it is also called by a few people May 3rd, 2020. But most of us call it the fourth Sunday of Easter. Today's opening hymn is This Joyful Easter Tide, which is hymn 482, if you have a hymnal. But if you don't, don't worry about it. The words are going to be on the screen along with the music, as well as the liturgy, so you can just follow right along. Don't forget, on Wednesday, we live stream a Romans Bible study. We've covered the first half of chapter 1. So this coming Wednesday, we're going to cover the second half. And the first two lessons you can uh, find on our Facebook page here. Also, uh, we certainly appreciate your prayers to support our church and, uh, and offerings. So if you want to send in an offering, our Redeemer Lutheran Church, 10 Johnson Road, Newark, Delaware, 19713. So, let us join together in worshiping our Lord Jesus with this joyful Easter tide in 482.
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We join in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A reading from Acts, the second chapter. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This, O Lord, have mercy on us. 
Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with joy and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle is from 1 Peter, the second chapter. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our sermon hymn is The King of Love My Shepherd Is, based on the 23rd Psalm, uh, and that's hymn 709.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's message is based off of our gospel lesson, and I read again John 10, verse 6. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. You know, I know of no human language that does not use figures of speech. They are a marvelous way of communicating, and God uses them all. Metaphors, similes, parables, and on and on. Now, I say human language because I don't know about computer languages. I don't think they have similes and metaphors, but I'm certainly not expert enough to say that for an absolute fact. And there might be some other specialized languages out there that don't use uh, figures of speech. But generally speaking, figures of speech are the norm, not the exception. And the Bible is chock full of them. We should expect this. After all, he who created our capacity for speech certainly knows how to utilize the full range of language. And he does in the Bible. For example, Jesus is called a master craftsman, especially in reference to his role in creation numerous times in the Old Testament. Or again, he is called uh, the rock or our rock or a rock uh, many times in the Bible. The Bible is not saying that Jesus was a big chunk of granite, but it's using that image to convey an idea to us. Certainly one of the most loved biblical figures of speech used in identifying Jesus is that of our good shepherd. In Psalm 22, the Lord is so depicted. There we find that he guards and keeps us in the green pastures of his church, leads us beside the quiet waters of baptism, and spreads his feast uh, on his table before us. That is the Lord's Supper. Now there are some who think that believing that the Bible is the inspired word of God, like I do, means that the Bible is to be understood in a wooden or literalistic fashion. I remember speaking to a man once, years ago now, who went to a church that taught this. Uh, in an effort to kind of dispel him of this false notion, I went to what I thought, think, and I do think, is the most symbolic book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. In chapter 13, we see described a beast that has seven heads and ten horns and uh, crowns on those horns coming out of the sea. And I looked at this guy and said, now, are you really expecting this sort of monster to come out of the sea? And he looked and he said, yes. So I changed tactics. I went to Revelation 9, where we read about a shaft that is located somewhere on this earth with this huge lid on it, and that shaft goes right down to the pits of hell. And an angel comes down with a key, and he unlocks the, the shaft, and he opens that lid, and out pours these hideous creatures, locusts with, with uh, hair like a woman and a mouth like a lion, and just weird tails like a scorpion and these things flood out and cover the planet attacking humanity and i said now do you really believe that somewhere on this earth if you looked long and hard you would find somewhere a shaft that goes all the way down to hell and he said yes i gave up he could not accept that he who created language uses language as a probe. But that is exactly what the Lord does. He is a master wordsmith. <clears throat> we find that in our gospel lesson for today. But we also see one of the dangers of figures of speech. Sometimes people simply fail to understand them. Either they fail to understand that a figure of speech is actually being used, like my acquaintance from so many years ago, or they recognize that a figure of speech is being used, they just don't understand it. 
And those of you who struggle with poetry know exactly what I'm talking about. The poet is using all these fancy words and you're just thinking, what is he talking about? Well, some people struggle more with images, that's true, which is why we got a lot of prose sections in the Bible as well. I don't know for sure, but I think the second option is in play when Jesus was speaking in our gospel lesson. That is to say, the people knew a figure of speech was being used, they just didn't get it. Perhaps they thought, hey, Jesus is a craftsman by trade, just like his father Joseph. What does he mean he's a good shepherd? Perhaps they were offended because Jesus was identifying him as a shepherd. Now I know Christ as a good shepherd is a warm and fuzzy feeling uh, it gives us in the modern mo world where we had this idea of Jesus protecting us and watching over us and so forth. But the people in the days of Jesus would not have automatically got this warm, comforting feeling from the image of the good shepherd. You see, while shepherds were vital for the economy of the area, they were also a low-class group of people. That is because, well, in part, they were just dirty, stinky, smelly people. Have you ever smelled a wet sheep? Well, that's what shepherds smelled like. <laughs> but the other thing is they, they worked seven days a week, and that meant they worked on the Sabbath, and that meant that they were perpetually unclean, and they could not worship uh, with the people in the temple on Sunday. Shepherds were not the sort of people that hung out with the scribes and the Pharisees. They were not high class. They were not even really middle class people. <clears throat> no matter what the reason, the people in the lower classes uh, tend to have jobs that people do not value. They are underappreciated even if they are vital to the sustaining of the community, like the shepherds were. After all, if the shepherds didn't do their work, what would have happened to the sacrificial system in first century Judaism? So uh, when Jesus identifies himself as a good shepherd, it could well have been very shocking and off-putting to the people. It might be if I was going to use an illustration, I might call Jesus the good trash truck driver, or the good garbage man. Uh, the United States got a good lesson on how important such individuals are back in 1968. In New York City, the sanitation workers went on strike. Now, you don't find too many trash truck drivers being invited to state dinners, the Oscars, or sitting at the table with the rich and famous. They just tend to get overlooked. However, as the trash began to pile up in New York City, people stopped overlooking the trash truck drivers and began to appreciate just how important they were, especially in a big city. If the shepherds had gone on strike, the whole sacrificial system, as I said, would probably have been crippled significantly. But without such a wake-up call, they continue to be undervalued, underappreciated, and overlooked. By the way, if I really wanted to do something like, you know, Jesus as the good trash truck driver, I would probably talk about how Jesus takes the trash of our self-righteous good works upon himself and gives us instead the work that he has accomplished for our salvation. And he takes our filthy trash and dumps it. Anyway, so the first point of this sermon is simply that God uses the full range of language skills in the Bible. The people listening to Jesus struggled because they didn't get the image Jesus was using. That is always a danger, and the further we are from the culture and the time when an image is first used, we are further, and it's just more difficult 
uh, and a greater challenge to understand what that image might mean. In our gospel lesson, Jesus actually uses two different images. In the first one, he is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper who opens the gate for the shepherd of the sheep uh, would be people like pastors and leaders in the church. And when I say leaders in the church, I don't mean elected leaders because you have a lot of people that are leaders in the church that are not elected to any particular position. If someone visits a congregation and these leaders and the pastor or whatever uh, treat that person rudely, they are gatekeepers, but what they're doing is they're slamming the gate of the church closed in that person's face. On the other hand, if a visitor comes and is greeted warmly and invited to participate in the congregation, uh, somebody helps him uh, with a worship service so he can follow along, uh, maybe even takes him out to lunch afterwards or whatever, that's a gatekeeper too. But the difference is, is they're throwing the gate open and inviting the person in. <clears throat> These are all gatekeepers who are opening the door. The sheep in the image are believers in the congregation. They are depicted as hearing the voice of the shepherd of the sheep. This plays off a well-known practice of shepherds in the first century that continued, I know for a fact, into the 19th century, probably into the 20th and 21st century, but I, I can't swear to that, but I do know at least ways into the 19th century. These shepherds, uh, these were Bedouin shepherds uh, in the 19th century, they give their sheep names. You know, Mildred, Mary, Elizabeth, Harriet, whoever, you know. And when uh, they would go and have sort of a confab, and all the shepherds would get together at a big grazing area, the sheep would all get together and they would mingle and... Uh, Shepherd Joe's sheep and Shepherd Harry's sheep would all be together. But when Shepherd Joe decided to leave, he would just start calling his, his sheep, Mary, Mildred, Gertrude, whatever. And the sheep would just come out from the flock because they heard their shepherd's voice calling their name. And then the shepherd would lead them away. The sheep hear their shepherd's voice and they follow him. <coughs> They would not follow a, shep uh, a stranger. If somebody else called their name, they would ignore him. So we believers are depicted as knowing our shepherd's voice and following him. This is what I think the people struggled with. What did Jesus mean by the sheep hearing the shepherd's voice? Jesus was pointing them to the gospel message of salvation by grace through faith. The false shepherds then were those who proclaimed good works as a way to placate God, to achieve favor in God's eyes. So we have that contrast of faith and works. This has wonderful gospel overtones, the calling that Jesus gives to the sheep. It accents grace in the calling of the shepherd. For the sheep don't call themselves, they're called by the shepherd. So we are lost and condemned until we hear the voice of our good shepherd in the gospel. Until then, we wander, we wander around aimlessly and uselessly, engaging in self-designed good works. Only the gospel call of Jesus can separate us from a life led by false shepherds that preach failed works. As the lesson says, the people didn't understand. So, like with that guy who I was talking to many years ago, Jesus tries again. The point I'm trying to make here, uh, the, you know, first I use uh, the beast and then I used uh, the, the pit. Uh, two different illustrations, two different ways of coming at the same question, but it was the same question each time. Uh, particulars changed, but what I was trying to say is the Bible uses figures of speech. So Jesus changed his image and his effort to communicate the gospel of grace. 
Now, instead of being the good shepherd, he says he is the door. The image is of a sheep pen, and these pens had doors. Doors are used for coming in and going out, obviously. There is no entrance into the people of God, into the pen, except by grace through faith in Jesus. Jesus is the door of grace. Jesus illustrates just how important he is as the door and the only legitimate way to enter into the people of God by introducing the character of the thief. These thieves seek to separate the sheep from the shepherd. They want to separate the sheep from the flock. They want to separate the sheep from the church. How do they seek to do this? Jesus says, the sheep did not hear them. In other words, these thieves are preaching also. But what are they preaching? They are not preaching grace. They are preaching a message which accents reliance on your own works. Your self-reliance, uh, pull yourself up by your own bootstrap, kind of, uh, we like to think of it as American man sort of a thing, but really that's humanity. We just want to pat ourselves on the back. Once again, we have accented that the message of grace and faith is the only way to hear what Jesus is saying. And it is contrasted to the words of the thief. The message of self works as a means to enter God's good grace also leads to death and destruction. As Jesus said, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus, though, has another plan for us. He said, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. We have a foretaste of that abundant life in our fellowship in the church, but its ultimate fulfillment will be when we are raised from the dead on the last day and join all believers in eternal glory. This is the purpose and goal of Jesus and therefore the purpose and goal of the gospel. Therefore the pastors are first the church, but then ultimately our eternal home with Jesus and all believers. We see a picture of this green pasture in our reading from Acts. There we see the life of the apostolic church. This re reading comes right after Pentecost. In fact, the verse <clears throat> just before our reading began today tells us, so, there were though, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So we have baptism and receiving the word, and then we have our reading out of Acts which tells us, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. So we have depicted for us the early church, the apostolic church, attending to the voice of the good shepherd through word and sacrament. I can also point out <coughs> that this harmonizes well with the 23rd Psalm, which we read earlier. <clears throat> There we have the still waters of baptism. We have the table prepared by the Lord, which points us to the Lord's Supper that we share. And we also have our eternal destination as we look forward to dwelling in the house of the Lord for how long? Forever. All this is a gift from our good shepherd. The Bible was not given to us as a mathematical equation. Our gracious Lord has given it to us in human language. That presents certain challenges as we can have difficulty understanding some of the figures of speech our Lord uses. However, we can, will never, never, never go far wrong if we remember two important truths about God's message in the Bible. The first truth is that... <clears throat> The first truth is the message about the uselessness of human effort to achieve heaven and God's favor. The second truth is God's free forgiveness in Jesus. Through him we have received pardon and peace. 
Through him we receive life and salvation, and he grants us gifts freely through his word and sacrament. We find these truths illustrated in Jesus' figures of speech in our gospel lessons today. We find them from Genesis to Revelation. We, as we keep these truths in our minds and hearts, they enable us to hear our good shepherd's voice, even when he speaks in figures of speech. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Continue our worship by worshiping our God of love with our gifts of love. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn us from all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound by the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, and that the numbers of Christians may be increased. We ask this not only for us, but for the universal church, especially the independent evangelical Lutheran church in Germany, and ask that you bless their bishop, Reverend Hans Jog Voigt. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Strengthen us by your spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of good and evil things, that our wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend those whom we now name in our hearts. We also remember all others who are in need, especially in our current times when the world is so anxious about COVID-19, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Grant us our daily bread, especially during this time of economic distress. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its way, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from evil of both body and soul, now and forever. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our final hymn is Jesus Christ, My Sure Defense, hymn 741. <laughs>
Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Live in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.